Welcome to Talking Giants Player Profiles and Projections. I'm your host, Bob Skinner, with my co-host, Justin Pennick. And today we start off with Evan Neal, right tackle for the New York Giants, 6'7", 350 pounds, 22 years old. Was the 7th overall pick in the 2022 NFL Draft. Coming off of a very bad rookie season, which we are hoping he can turn around, was dealing with some old shoulder injury, shoulder injury stuff. But Justin... To me, I don't think there is one player whose swing and play decides how well this season can go as much as Evan Neal. You know, we have baseline, you know, production for a lot of players. If Evan Neal stays at the same same player or close to, it's going to be a real struggle to do some things on offense they want to do. If he makes steps forward, it's going to open up the playbook by a mile. Yeah, Bobby Skinner, what's going on, everybody? Evan Neal. I'll give you a little peel behind my curtain which I'm sure a bunch of people want to see. Uh, I have a document, PPP 2023 notes. I usually try and write down stats, you know, even if it's just thoughts, questions for Bobby Skinner about each player. I have two lines of notes for Evan Neal, partially because I don't want to revisit (laughs) 2022 stats and 2022 thoughts on Evan Neal. And I am really nervous for a lot of the reasons that you just said at the top about how important Evan Neal can be to this offense. And if he is at a good level, you know, the the limits at which this Giants offense can possibly touch, like, ooh, do we dare start talking like top 10 offense? If the Giants offense is top 10 by, the, by season's end, it's most likely because Evan Neal has taken a second-year jump. And I'm not even talking about a second-year jump to being an above average or good tackle, but even just an average tackle would dramatically change the trajectory of this Giants offensive line. And I am nervous about Evan Neal's overall development, but also, hey, it's the summer. I'm confident that he has gotten better. Well, the expectation should be to be a good player. You're picked seventh overall. And you know what? If the Giants only had one first round pick that year, he probably gets picked fifth overall. Evan Neal should be a good player. That should be the expectation. Um, and let's talk about his last season, and then we'll talk about the things he can get better at, and obviously offensive line is the one I can have the most fun with. Last year in 13 games, he gave up seven sacks, 10 QB hits, and 22 pressures. He had the second-worst tackle efficiency in the NFL. The only person that was, was worse was Dennis Daly, who was a backup tackle for the Chargers, uh, I believe. And those stats are with being protected in their passing game. Like, a lot of the play-action stuff they were doing was protecting Evan Neal by giving him tight end help or, you know, making them defend the run. And even when they did go to some drop-back passing, it was still protecting Evan Neal by making it almost all quick game, right? Early down quick game. Like, he was very bad. And why was he bad on film? Well, one, he was very slow out of his stance in general. And that's something we noticed in training camp last year. It's like, he is kind of just late out of his stance. It's a little discombobulated. And ends were you know edges were getting to the corners fairly easily and that just like opened up another can of worms though too where his feet would get crossed up and the thing that i am the most worried about him is he still is head heavy that was a negative on the you know the scouting reports when we did our draft recaps last year he is head heavy and that would lead to guys working inside or using his hands against him and, and you know turning that sh- inside shoulder where it's like hey if i'm not gonna if he's gonna open his hips and run me around the corner well, I'm gonna I'm gonna counter back inside, get up the inside shoulder. We saw Hassan Reddick do it a bunch of times, and and you know kind of turn him over. Um, so those were the things that he got really that really really struggled with, um, and I think it was mixed with you know the big loose stance, which we're gonna talk about with Willie Anderson. They worked to fix also some of their aggressive pass sets. You know those forty five sets instead of you know vertical sets that he did a little more Alabama. It made you, you have, to, you have to be quicker off the ball in those, you know, uh, where vertical sets, you can, you know, you you know, it's not, you don't need to be the fastest in the world to get back there on those. Um, he really needs like, but Willie Anderson, step one, working with him, who was, you know, an all pro, you know, hall of fame tackle was making that stance tighter and more compact where he can explode out of it. And you watch Andrew Thomas play on the opposite side. Andrew Thomas gets out of his stance. Bah, 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 bah. And what Neil really struggled with was getting to that third step where it's one, two, and then that third step, he's got that edge pressure and he's opening up his hips because, hey, if you could do that third step and they're already at, at, you know, 
uh, got good proportion on you, they'll just run past you. So he would open up those hips and try and run them around. Sometimes they still get around the corner. And then, but once you get off, uh, opening up your hips and you're dealing with being a little top heavy, man, you get off balance very quick. And that's where guys start countering inside and made Evan Neal. Getting to your landmarks uh, th- throughout the entire, throughout the entirety of last year's offensive line report. And basically every week was, uh, looking at Evan Neal and looking at you know some hey some good plays that he had like that that Washington tie I thought was his best game that he had last year and that was a game where he did get to his landmarks he did get out of his stance he did look really athletic um, but getting to your landmark and getting to that third step like the no, I I think the magic number in football especially for offensive tackles is that number three if you can get to, back to that third step in whether it's a forty five degree kick step whether it's a vertical kick step whatever. If you it's can get to be that a magic, set. if you can get back, if you can get to that magic, I'm, I'm saying regardless of what set you're running, if you can get to that magic number three, I feel like most of the time, you know, unless you just get, you know, bull rushed, you're going to win that battle and you're going to put yourself in a position for, for success. All right. So you talked a little bit about the new stance, Bobby. Um, I kind of want to get to like who Evan Neal is as kind of like a person and as a worker too, because I'm confident that. Like this is a dude that's going to work hard. This is the this is a dude that was working tremendously hard even last year, you know, just despite all of his issues. But I also think too and some of the coaching staff has talked about this a little bit, but I can easily see this with Evan Neal. I can easily see last year, you know, confidence issue. You know, when when you get off to such a bad start and, you know, you you, you continue to get off to a bad start, you you get hurt in the middle of the year too. I can imagine confidence is an issue. I can imagine overthinking, overthinking from day one before he even stepped foot on a field for the Giants, overthinking, you know, changing positions again. I think that's part of it. Putting pressure on yourself, being a top 10 pick, being the right tackle for the New York football Giants, learning a, a new a new system and Bobby Johnson's new ways, new way of doing things. I can imagine all three of those things it was like a combination for him last year. And I'm hoping that, you know, he has more confidence heading into this year. He's not overthinking. He feels way more comfortable getting out of a stance. He feels comfortable with the speed of the game. I mean, you're always going to put pressure on yourself, but I'm hoping he can just kind of rise above that. Do you think that's tied into, like, his 2022 performance at all, like all three of those things? Yeah, I mean, confidence is, is always a big part of your game. But, like, you, you talk about with the landmarks. If he can get to his landmarks and get his hands on guys without being lunging or getting, you know, his his head over his shoulder, you know, his shoulders over his knees – that's where he's his best, you know, once he's locked on with those guys. And, you know, he's got good hand usage. You know, his feet can stay square if he does that. But, again, it's about getting to those landmarks, and it starts with getting out of your stance quickly. Um, but, yeah, playing – I mean, confidence is a big part of that. Getting to that third step without opening your hips is the thing about confidence because if you don't trust that you have the athleticism, like that's when you open up your hips and start running with guys, and that's where you get in trouble. Um, and – when we talk about his growth, because the expectation should be to grow this year and get better. But if, if this is what we want to use for the clip for the PPP, then, then let's be it. Evan Neal, if he's going to get better and be better in year two, it's going to be because of Evan Neal. It's not going to be because of Andrew Thomas's year two jump. And we mm-hmm. need to stop comparison, comparing Andrew Thomas to Evan Neal. They are two different players with two different career trajectories. Andrew Thomas, by the end of his rookie year, was something to be proud of. I have the receipt saying, I am proud of Andrew Thomas' rookie year and the growth he made. And guess what? Evan Neal, if he grows, it is because it is because of Evan Neal. A lot of tackles suck year one and they don't get better year two. Andrew Thomas got a lot better in year two than year one, but there was upward trajectory. There wasn't that with Evan Neal. Now the expectation is still to be good. But that will be good because Evan Neal prepared and worked his ass off all summer and got better at his craft and trusted his body more because he didn't do that as a rookie. And he really never didn't look like that at any point. Yeah, man, I, I, I'm rooting for Neal. I'm rooting for Neal. I, I really don't want to – the reason why I don't have a ton of notes then is I don't want to labor on what was a really bad rookie here. I don't want to labor on it. Uh, but also, I do want to emphasize what you said at the start of if Evan Neal turns into an average tackle or even, you know, if, if he reaches his potential and needs a good tackle, like we're talking about this Giants offense reaching points that we haven't seen 
since Eli Manning was quarterback and there was number 13 running around. And even before that, when you had Victor Cruz, Hakeem Nix, Mario Manningham, like that, that is the levels. And, and even that, and even those offenses, they couldn't even run the ball. <laughs> you know, those, those lines weren't even that great. So Evan Neal's like kind of his trajectory, it kind of is tied to how we see this offense's potential. And the run game struggled last year, too, with Evan Neal. Like, he had false steps galore paired with being top-heavy, and, and it would led to some bad reps. So, again, getting that, getting those feet right. Get those, get that footwork right. But the reason why Evan Neal is such a big swing on what the Giants can do and do in their playbook isn't simple, isn't just simple O-line good, O-line bad. Like, you can beat man coverage with bad offensive line play. But where coaching can really show off is by putting players in conflict down the field. But you can't even attempt to do that if you can't protect as a tackle. Yeah. If you can't have your tackles protecting, you can't put those deep safeties in conflict, you know? Or you, when you do it, you do it, you know, very rarely. And it just puts so much more stress on a defense if you can protect. I mean, think about think about all the years where we didn't have pass rush, you know? Um, it's like, man, it's this is this puts a lot of pressure when you can't get there with four. And then if yep. you send five and you can't get there, then it's a real pain in the ass. So it's like if you send six, man, then you're – that's not a way to live on a down-to-down basis. So uh, pass rush, man, is, is very important. And that's like, – we know how important pass rushing having a duo of edges. Well, guess what? Think about how important on the opposite side having a duo of tackles are. Yep. Because if we can have that, man, that is a great path to sustain success for a long time for the New York Giants if we have both tackle spots set. So Evan Neal, man, this is the player – in training camp, I know this training camp has started once this comes out. This is the player I am watching the closest because of how important he is and how much growth there needs to be. So, Evan Neal, be a dog. Adore Jackson, cornerback at five foot eleven, one hundred eighty five pounds. Justin, he's only twenty seven years old, turning twenty eight this year, but he's coming. He's coming into the last year of a three year, thirty nine million dollar contract. Justin, um, for two years with the New York Giants. He's been outstanding. Like, his play is outstanding, but he's another player where injuries are an ex- expectation with him. That's really tough to say when last year it was so not his fault. Okay, but he's missed 7, 4, 13, and 5 games the last four seasons. Almost, almost I know. half of the game. So it, I know. But it is his fault. Like, the reason you don't put Adora Jackson as punt returner is because he's injury prone and an important player. Right. Right. If we had Deion Sanders at playing corner, we had no well, problem. It's because Adore like he returned one punt and got injured. So he's he is an injury prone player. He misses games every single year. Yeah. And it's a shame that we're leading off with the Dory Jackson's PPP talking about, you know, how he's inevitably an injury prone player when dude. He upgraded the CB1 last year after the departure of James Bradbury, and he was really, really good. And I think this Wink Martindale scheme fits him so well. Um, you know, let's just talk about him and man coverage. Adore Jackson, 13th lowest completion percentage allowed in man coverage via PFF amongst quarterbacks with at least like 400 snaps. His average depth of target in man coverage was really, really low. Yeah. He was tied for fifth in pass breakups in man coverage. He was tied for the 12th most snaps in man coverage despite missing so many games. Fabian Moreau was third in the NFL in man coverage snaps, so either Adoree is second or first if he's if he's healthy. Um, and overall, it was the lowest completion rate he's allowed in his career, the second lowest average depth of target overall uh, in his career, and the second lowest QB rating when he was targeted. So Adoree Jackson had a really good year, and we were worried about can he – can he fulfill the CB1 roles after 2021? He was CB2 and he did well. Well, when you're covering better wide receivers, how can you do? And he did it well, man. He, he was outstanding, you know. And and when you're saying like second best this, second best this, all, it's all second best to 2021 with the Giants, you know, where he was the most outstanding defensive player on that team to me. Um, now, this past year was still outstanding, but not he wasn't the absolute shutdown corner that he was in 2021. Um, you know, but still, you know, he was defending the second best player on the field in 2021. Like there was games like CD lamb kind of has his number. Tyler Lockett got him. Um, Darnell Mooney had one catch over him, but that was one catch. He played really well. Um, 
But like you said, I mean, he gave up lowest completion percentage allowed last year. Um, and, you know, was the seventh best in completion percentage allowed, but a higher, uh, but did have higher yards per catch, 11.7 yards compared to 8.9 the year before. Um, and in 2020, in 2021, was just insane where he was top five in completion percentage and also top five in yards per catch allowed, which that, those usually don't go together. It's like either you're allowing, you know, sh- a small yards per catch or you're a uh, high completion or small completion percentage guy. Very rarely both. But yeah, he was the stud as, as a cornerback one. You know, I mean, only he gave up 33 yards per game with two bad games in there versus Tyler Lockett and CeeDee Lamb. I mean, just think about his, hey, he missed seven games last year, comes back just for the playoffs. And Justin Jefferson, best wide receiver in the NFL, had seven catches for 47 yards. And, like, three of those were on the first drive of the game. It's a win. It's a like, big win. Was was huge. Like, when putting in Dora Jackson on man coverage, as like, what stopped Jefferson Jefferson from beating the New York Giants. Like, he is an extremely important player for them. Like, he is, he is so important to this team. And the Giants probably win 10 or 11 games last season in the regular season of Thor Jackson never gets down now every team deals with injury so you can't play the the what if game and he's a player who you expect to miss games at this time uh but he is I mean he was re- he was very good last year. and we saw a noticeable improvement in the run game like you saw him putting an emphasis as a run defender last he year. was huge there too there have, I have multiple clips of you know him him making plays there so yeah man I, I want to talk about this will be the last time I ever talk about it I do want to talk about how mad I was at Brian Dable that he did put him back there to return. I, I still don't think it's fair. I know he's an injury prone player and maybe he gets hurt at some other point doing something on defense. Hey, like, Hey, going after a running back defended run, he does something to his knee. Right. But last year he was on a track where, Hey, he wasn't going to miss games. And the only, only reason why he did miss games is because Brian Dable put him in a, in a completely unnecessary situation that everybody knew was going to go wrong. So I get it. That is an Adoree Jackson problem, but also, it's a Brian Dable problem that he put him back there anyway, and it arguably costed this team, like you said, like maybe at least one victory. Like that, Wash- we don't tie against Washington if Dory Jackson is playing in that game. Yeah, I mean, again, yeah, if he, if do not let him return. Like, do not let him return. And even Brian Dable, I know Brian Dable. If you asked him if John Michael Smith is going to maybe return kicks, he wouldn't. He wouldn't deny it. But Brian Dable should even at this time. No, that we're not. We're not going to let him do that so you cannot have him as part of the return i don't care how good was he was at USC mistake. doing that um but again like he missed seven games last year he missed four the year before 13 in tennessee and then five before that yeah. um he is again on the last year of a contract three years 39 million dollars plays a valuable position he's put up really good film if he plays if he, let's, let's say like 2021, he misses four games this year, plays really well like he did last year. At 28 years old, do you offer him another three year deal with an out in the third year? You just drafted Deontay Banks. Like, do you, like it? Do you, not even would you, do you think he is in the plans for the Giants to bring back? I think he should be. A what good worries player. me is hurt guys get hurt, man, and, and they get hurt even more as they get on in their career. That's what worries me about Adore. Like, his play, yep. absolutely. Not even a doubt. Like, if season ends and, and we're not worrying about injuries to Adore, sign him back, sign him back. Big contract, I don't care what the number is. But that's what worries me about Adore is hurt guys get hurt. Um, this isn't a position, in my opinion, that you go and you say, yeah, we'll find another. Unless it's in free agency. I think that's like the exception. If, if there's like a man coverage corner that you want to go after in free agency and he's played games, then 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 go for it. But um, I think if you have a good player who's been good in your system and this this will be a big year for him, right? If he, hey, let's just say Brian Dable's the reason why Adoree Jackson missed games last year. He was going to stay healthy if Brian Dable didn't put him in that compromising situation where he got his knee hit, if he got his knee hit like that. But if I don't plays, like that assumption though. Because there were seven more games for him to be injured, get injured like he does, and he got he in, get, he, he got injured. Hurt before like, then. Yes, was it returning kicks? But it wasn't like he sent them like Brian Dable didn't send him out there and go, "Hey, go kick this rock twenty five times." Like he no, did, it, he sent them out there to play football. We knew, we knew that it was 
Because the he's injury prone. Worst idea. Though. Because yes. he's injury prone, and you don't want to take any chance that you don't have to with Adoree Jackson. But so you you don't know or I don't know if he was going to make it through last year. But Brian Dable didn't give him that opportunity. Where this year he is going to be given that opportunity. Okay, but he's going to he, be. He's an injury prone player who got in. Who's got injured for? He got last injured doing years. something that he should have never been doing. Okay, he's injury prone though. No, I, and Again, I agree he, with he you. He got injured being tackled on a football field. It's I not agree like it's not you. like they fucking send him out to go head to head. Ten, 10 times. Go, 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 go face up. You sound like Carl like, Banks go. last year. What? You sound like Carl Banks last year. It was year. a dumb decision, but he's an injury prone. It's a dumb decision because he's injury prone. I'm not disagreeing. I'm not disagreeing with you. So the assumption that he would not have gotten any injury over the last seven games, like that goes against, that's that's going against the history of Adore no, Jackson. We don't, we don't know. You don't know and I, you don't know, and I okay. don't know. So, but he, but well, my you point didn't know he was going to get injured then if you returned punt beforehand then. But we all knew it was no, a you didn't know. bad idea. We all knew it was you a bad idea. You didn't know. No one knew. All right. All right. Easy there. Um, all right. That's the player profile projection. We'll be back uh, tomorrow with another podcast. Uh, Arch Stapleton. So go check out all the other PPPs. Anything else on Adore Jackson? No, no. I, I was going to say he was gonna be, he's going to be getting an opportunity to Prove that this year, um, you know, and I and I don't think the Giants should, especially at this particular position, if they have a player that's contributing and if they have a player that's good, even if he misses some games, um, I think that's a player that's kind of worth keeping around because corners are kind of tough to tough to replace. I think a lot has to do with how Deontay Banks plays too. Like if Deontay yeah. Banks has a really successful rookie Flott. season, it yeah. makes you a little more comfortable. If he struggles, maybe you. you want to do what you can to keep a Dory around so all right we appreciate you guys we'll see you on the next one until then let's go big blue